Okay, very good. Well, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Um, I think I might let Krista start by telling a little bit about how you can type notes into the chat box. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yes, um, some of you have been on, I'm over here, I'll just camera view. But, um, if you have any questions or comments um, throughout today's session, just type into the question section. I see some of you are already in there. Um, it's uh, one of the items on your uh, go to webinar interfaces questions. Type in there. I'm monitoring that over here on this laptop. Um, if you have your own microphone, um, just tell me and I can unmute you and you can use your microphone to ask your question. So you want them to tell you by just um, typing in the chat yeah, box? Yeah, just type so. in. I have an, a mic and a question. Please unmute me. Okay. And I will do that for you. No problem. Um, but if you want to just type, go ahead. Um, type in whenever you want to. Anything that comes to mind, and I will just collect them all here. And as they're as needed, I will jump in and interrupt um, appropriately <laughs> to ask the questions. Yeah, feel free to ask questions uh, all through. Uh, the one hour webinar and, uh, and if you do miss anything we are recording and it'll be posted up later onto the um, grant website so if you miss some question or answer you'll be able to go back and watch it and listen to it later. right and we'll also send you the link because you probably have other members of your uh, staff or committee action team that probably aren't tuning in mm -hmm. and if you'd like them to hear it too you can share the link uh, and I'll send hopefully send that to you later today, if not today, tomorrow. Uh, so on our webinar today, we have a few facility facilitators who will be um, presenting today. Uh, I'm Joanne McManus, and I'm the project manager for this particular project. Uh, we also have Max Wheeler, and he was the new hire at the University of Nebraska. And, he, <laughs> <laughs> and he'll be talking to you today, too. And he is really the person that is in charge of uh, the training and knowing the machines and helping you with those, machine, with those pieces of equipment. We have Mary Jo uh, Ryan. She is also with the Nebraska Library Commission, is our and is our communications quarter coordinator. And if you have any questions about press releases or whatever, she's your go-to person there. On the line today is Connie Hancock with Nebraska Extension. She will also be talking, especially in the area of community engagement and working locally. Uh, so you'll hear from her. And we also have Dagan Valentine, and he is also with Nebraska Extension. And um, he will be visiting with you as well. And of course, we have Rod Wagner, our director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And I think he will get us started on talking about our partners that are involved in this project. Click your partners. There we go. Several partners involved in the project. Um, um, Prominently, we have the uh, our partners, Nebraska Extension, Nebraska Innovation Studio, um, our Nebraska Regional Library Systems, and of course, our funding agency, the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Did you want me to mention that on the earlier project? Yeah, yeah. Kind of um, say how we got started on this project. Yeah, Joanne asked me to uh, go back and uh, mention um, some projects that we have um, done in uh, partnership between the Library Commission and Nebraska Extension in particular. And this goes back several years to the Library Broadband Builds Nebraska Communities Project, a federally funded uh, project of several years ago that also included funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Along the way, we also uh, were in partnership uh, where the Library Commission contributed to the Nebraska Broadband Mapping Project. And uh, also somewhat recently, but uh, already finished a few years ago, was a financial education project that was funded through a FINRA grant. Uh, and this, the uh, Nebraska Extension uh, provided significant training for that project. So we have uh, continued to have uh, conversations 
and those meetings led toward uh, the project that is now before us um, and also um, developed uh, as part of those discussions uh, came the uh, grant through the uh, National Science Foundation uh, and working with Brad Barker on uh, that one. So uh, a number of things have led toward uh, the Nebraska Innovation, or excuse me, the Library Innovation Studios project, and uh, we're very excited about it, and uh, very much appreciate the uh, interest we've had from the Nebraska Libraries. Very good. Thank you, Rod. Yeah, we, um, that, our work with partners, we just keep wanting to build on all the success we've had, and now we've got two great new projects because we started taking an active role in seeing how we can work together. So on today's agenda, we'll be covering, uh, we'll be going around introducing the folks on the call today, um, other than those of us talking here in Lincoln. Um, we will be reviewing the project goals and overviews, uh, talking about partner recognition and role clarification. We'll be talking about the train the trainer trainings that are coming up, uh, both here in Lincoln and locally. We'll talk about local calendar of activities that, you can, that you'll be scheduling in your uh, libraries and communities. We'll be talking about that equipment. And then we will have time for questions and answers at the end, but please don't wait until the end and um, put that in the chat box and we can you can either just type in your question or you can ask uh, Krista to unmute you and we can get your uh, get you on the line and answer your question as we go. So as far as our introductions um, um, I did mention who is here from the team but we also, um, Connie, do you want to say a few words about Nebraska Extension and, and your role there? Um, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so um, Nebraska Extension has um, partnered, and, and we obviously have offices in all, or, or represent all 93 counties. And so um, we've tried to have conversation with our local Extension educators about this particular project and I think most of those folks um, are excited about the opportunity to partner with the local library and bringing the mobile maker space to their community. And so we're um, excited about that. I see there's a, a few of those folks on uh, the call today. And then um, we obviously have some of the same kinds of goals that this project has in our own programming. And so it really is a nice fit for the work that we do, as well as what we're trying to do in our local communities. Thank you. And I know today we also have uh, we also have two of our regional library system directors on the line. Scott was not able to join us, so Anika and Denise, do you want to say a few words? as Denise Harders and Anika Ramirez. Hi, uh, this is Anika. Um, yeah, I just, you know, I'm excited to help support the, the libraries in our area, um, Platt Smith with, um, you know, helping look at community engagement or uh, how they can create programming. Anything that we can really do, I think, is, is kind of the, the uh, goal for the regional library systems as a partner um, is to just be that support for our libraries, some extra hands or um, an outside point of view if they need that. And this is Denise and Anika and I and Scott and uh, Jan out in the Western Library System have talked about helping put together some policies and how we can assist in that way. That will be big help. That will be. Um, and let's let's say hi to our um, libraries that are on the line. Um, I don't know who you want to unmute first. Uh, should we start with Plattsmith since Plattsmith will be our first library? 
And Rasmus, do you have a microphone hooked up? Yeah, what you mean? And Karen, I unmuted you if you have a microphone. And and all of you libraries, you can when if you get unmuted and and are able to visit with us, kind of let us know um, who you um, might have in your at your library location tuning in, whether you have part of your uh, community <coughs> action team with you or your extension educator. And I know some of you are at different sites, so you're not just all sitting in the same room. <coughs> oh, Karen says she does not have a microphone. Okay, so um, maybe Karen, if you want to just type in who's with you and um, what organizations maybe they represent, then we'll ask Krista to read that, if you don't mind typing that in the chat. Okay. And and so let's if uh, maybe Ainsworth while they're pardon me. I just have the names. Uh, Gail Irwin. Oh, Gail said that she's there with Wanda Raymond. <coughs> and um, Ashlyn. Heather. So, can we unmute you up together? All right, Gail's microphone is not working, but she has, um, Heather's there with three additional members of her team, Gail's there with Wanda Raymond, and Karen has Barb Miller there, her assistant library director with her. And her team will be meeting on Wednesday. Okay. And who is that that's meeting on Wednesday? Classman. Uh, Classman. Yes. Now I'm going there. Yeah. No, where am I supposed to be on Wednesday? I just thought I'd better make sure I'm not meeting in two places at once. And then we have uh, Luke City and Crete as well. And from an extension perspective, Joanne, Eric Stelic is on representing Crete. Hi, Eric. Are you, are you got a microphone that we can unmute? unmute? I think so. Hi, Eric. <laughs> Hello. And I just want to mention, um, as we're talking, um, I think everyone probably is aware of it, but maybe not all the libraries. Um, in this first round, as you all know, we have four maker kits. And typically, we bring you the entire maker kit, but in in this round, we have five libraries, and Loop City and Cree are both what we call mini studios, and that means that they don't really have enough space to put up to bring in all the equipment at once. So we're going to be splitting that equipment between those two libraries. Each li each of those two libraries will get half of the equipment, and then 11 weeks later, we will pick up the equipment and flip them. And uh, Max is working on a, a list of how to split those equipment between those two libraries. Libraries, because we need some equipment to stay together and others. Yep. It's easy to split. And so uh, very within the next couple of days, we will get you your list of which equipment you get early and at the end. Luke, can you unmute your, your microphone? Um, not every, I don't know that everybody has microphones. Okay, can you see it? But um, Heather at Ashland did say um, she has a staff member, Sarah, a library foundation member, Terry, and my community member there with her. Great. And um, hello, everyone. Joy Stevenson at Creek says it's just her right now, but Laura, Laura Ranker will be joining her as soon as she can. Um, for the story time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we want to the story time. So Loop City, City, can we get you to type in the chat box um, who's there with you and at what organizations they represent? Yeah, I've been trying to... Uh, trying to uh, oh, oh. Oh. Audrey, I'm going to mute you. Because there's a lot of feedback, so can you just type in? Okay. 
Oh, and Tracy Ensor is on from Extension in Cass County as well. Hi, Tracy. Um, there you go, Tracy. Okay. Well, I think we'll just move on so we can get through our agenda. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to start off with a huge congratulations. Uh, thank you for being part of this grant, doing all the, the front end work in submitting the application, uh, interacting with your community partners, and forming your community action teams. A huge thank you and congratulations. Uh, Makerspaces really have the potential to contribute to entrepreneurship, community development, education, non-cognitive skills, college and career readiness skills. So there's lots of great impact that can come out of having a makerspace in your communities. And uh, there's lots of research on, on makerspaces, and I kind of boil it down into kind of three buckets, people, place, and then creation and innovation, that making part. And uh, I looked at your um, applications, and I kind of wanted to identify some of those um, things that highlighted that. So within um, Crete, uh, they're looking at engaging the growing population of 24-year-old and younger groups, so looking at those people and people isn't just the people that are in the space, but also the larger community. And so that's really cool. Um, Ashland, you've identified entrepreneurs in the community, and you see this makerspace is helping bring their ideas to fruition. There are other partners and people involved, but this is just one couple examples. Uh, around place, this is the physical place. So you, you all sent pictures and thought about where this stuff is going to live in your libraries, but also your place in the community and how you can contribute to the, the greater good for your community. And um, we've identified some of the, the physical spaces and engaging the partners. So, um, and all of those, you all did a great job in, in identifying those. But around creation, that making part. So, Plattsmith um, has already been doing some Tinker Space programming, and they're looking at continuing their efforts on a little larger scale with some of the equipment they're getting from this makerspace grant. And also, Loop City has identified even needs from their parents said that they want more hands-on technology um, to benefit some of those career-oriented youth. And also Ainsworth, the, the cutest one I thought was a support letter from an eight-year-old uh, named Kinley, and the quote from her was, she's excited to use the equipment and learn new, new things. Y'all are engaging the, the people, the places you live, and really looking at that creation and innovation. So a huge congratulations on this grant, and we look forward to the partnership and collaboration moving forward. Thank you, Dagan. So I guess uh, one of the things we wanted to mention is that we really see three goals as guiding the Makerspace project. And the first one is that rural community residents will be empowered with tools and some guidance to explore collaborate, create, learn, and invent. So there's a goal for those rural individuals that it will be meaningful learning experience for them. And then secondly, that the libraries can help to transform their rural communities through creating a participatory learning space and establishing themselves as a strong community catalyst for community change. And that's that community engagement piece. That's the place in which we, we spread out from the individuals that are having experiences in the makerspace, to the groups that are interacting in the makerspace, to the groups that see this as having an impact on their community. And then, of course, our goal is to also provide information to libraries across the country so that rural libraries can have a replicable model that might be useful to them. Um, we think these goals really dovetail with community goals. And the community goals, we've been looking at, by the way, your library strategic plans, and we're seeing community goals that really fit with this. And Connie might want to talk a little bit about how that, those local community goals um, overlap with our overall, overall goals for the project. Um, absolutely, Mary Jo. I think that's a, a great segue into really uh, delving into your community itself. Um, I think part of the partnership that we've established with the Nebraska Library Commission is that we all realize that our resources are limited and how can we build capacity at the local level to make um, not only the makerspace, the mobile makerspace successful, but then how can we build on that to make it sustainable after the mobile makerspace is gone? And so as you think about your action team and your whole community, 
um, who else needs to be at the table. But it, but at the, at the same time, what are your community goals? Are you trying to attract people? Are you building entrepreneurship? Um, is it around economic development kinds of stuff? Um, the school system and 4-H in particular both have a STEM or a STEAM initiative that fits very much into the whole concept of what makerspaces are all about. Um, sharing that knowledge and as Dr. Ferreter and his vision for the state of Nebraska um, is, is creating that network of networks. And so having uh, the partnership with Nebraska Innovation Studio as kind of the Taj Mahal of uh, makerspace here in our state, how can um, we share that knowledge at, uh, in our rural communities across the state? And we know that we've got a lot of really smart people that live in rural Nebraska. And so having them part of that makerspace, having them invent or create or mentor, um, sharing that information with other makerspaces, um, I think is gonna be really exciting. The other piece of that is um, just the, the whole concept of the networking and learning from each other. And that's really part of those community goals and how we, um, how we make this successful in the future. We all know that there's a, a problem today of X, Y, and Z. How can we work together to solve that problem and create something that may end up being a prototype and may, may be the next best widget um, that can create jobs in our rural community? So as we think about just the makerspace itself, there really is a much bigger vision in, um, in that. And so creating that network of networks and working together then to um, establish our own um, sustainability and success within the, the areas that we work. Getting the buy-in from community is gonna be extremely critical. Um, as we start to showcase the kinds of things that are being created through, um, through the makerspace uh, during the time that you have access to it. And I guess one of the things we've talked about a lot is that um, all of your community goals are, they might be similar, but they're all unique. And so it will be a unique solution finding process in each community. Absolutely, Mary Jo. And the other thing along with that is each community is going to be unique in what they focus their makerspace on. And um, what one community, what works in one community is not necessarily going to work in another community. So I think you need to keep that in mind that what, what really is going to work in my community and who, who do I need to bring to the table to help me make that successful. Thanks, Connie. Joanne, you want to tell us a little bit more about this project? Yeah, and I'm not going to spend much time on this because we got other things to cover, but it is a three-year project. Um, grant started July 1st of this year. We end June 30th of 2020. That's our official end date. Those last four kits will still be in library, and we won't bring those in until later in 2020 because um, we just, we really wanted to make sure everybody had those uh, equipment as long as they can so we try to stretch it out and give it have everyone have it for about 20 weeks um, we were funded with an IMLS grant uh, leadership grant for over uh, half a million dollars 531,000 and the Nebraska Library Commission and UNL is having to match that one-to-one -one, but we're prob primarily matching that with staff time and um, we have a lot of folks here our partners, our uh, Nebraska Extension Partners, is putting in a lot of staff time. And many of you know those of us here at the commission, but we have a lot of people working on this project. Uh, we have Holly Walt, Craig Lefteroff, uh, Deborah Dragos, uh, Cynthia Nye is our new hire and is our project assistant. Uh, we have uh, Sam, um, Shaw, um, Krista, Mary Jo, I mean, there's just a lot of us working on that project. And sorry if I wasn't anybody off, but there's, <laughs> there's a team and an extension has a team as well. I think we do. And then um, it is a multifaceted project. There's a lot of things going on. Obviously, um, the 30 rural and small communities will be establishing their community action team. We're going to talk a lot more about that today. We have already purchased our equipment and components for the four rotating studios. 
There's a few last minute things we need to purchase, but most of the main equipment is purchased. And many of you saw that at our um, at NLA conference uh, last week in Kearney. Uh, we're going to be, with the help of Max primarily, we're going to be developing uh, instructional materials and equipment certification processes. We're going to work with you to employ sustainability strategies so you can consider um, permanent studios or at least some permanent equipment. Um, this is really a nice try it before you buy it type uh, project. Uh, we're going to be providing equipment training. Uh, focusing on the train the trainer strategies. So we'll be training the trainers, and then your trainers will then in turn train your patrons and customers. Uh, we'll be assisting you with local marketing and programming and event planning. Uh, everyone will get about a 20 week hosting period. They'll have an open house. Before the end, you'll have a major showcase. Um, you'll be doing programming in between, and we'll be talking about that later. And then once a year, we're going to host an annual vendor showcase uh, in Lincoln that you can also attend. Before we move to the next slide, are there any questions? Um, I know you're having some microphone challenges, but um, if you would just type your questions in the chat box, Krista will interrupt us. And that's fine. We're interruptible. Yeah. Joy at Crete does have a question, and I'm not sure if you're going to talk about this later, about um, <laughs> splitting their equipment because they're doing a mini. Makerspace wanted to know if Christmas holidays have been taken into account for that schedule. As you would just know splitting. if she means not having it, actually having it on that. Well, um, yes, you might be closed uh, during the holidays, uh, but yeah, we've taken that into account. And um, unless you'd like to open. <laughs> <laughs> But if you think, you know, if you think we picked a week for the swap that isn't kind of right in the middle, we can visit about that. And Oh, she means is the total time you have as equipment, is it still for 11 weeks even with Christmas? Well, the library is closed during Christmas, I guess that's what she means. Okay, well, she Do they not lose a week because they're not? Well, she can do the math. We told her about what we're Giving it or when we're going to pick it up, and so she can look at her calendar. I mean, I, he, I could do that, and I try to do that, but 11 weeks is probably an average. I don't know if it's exactly 11 weeks. And, and if there's a, some problem with the swap dates, you can work those out as you go along. Correct. Because those swap dates can be slightly adjusted, maybe. Right. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Says thanks, no worries. She just do this. Well, um, I just want to first of all say that we we hate to give you this slide with these little tiny tiny font size on the letters, but the the idea of this um, is that we try to look at a big picture of the whole project and try to figure out what what would be guiding us throughout the whole project. And one of the things that we decided was that that our partners were extremely important. In guiding the entire big picture, and so we were, we felt we needed to just list all of these wonderful partners and and what they contribute, which of course is more than just this physical space. But this gives you an idea of the kinds of things that that we think are are important in terms of the what will feed into the activities that are going to take place. And the activities, of course, include instruction and in organizing, and also um, in, in terms of the evaluation. And that I just might mention is one of the things that we'll be asking you to do, um, both you, the library staff, and the extension educators, but also the other trainers that you uh, recruit, the other volunteers that you recruit, the mentors that you recruit, will be collecting information about who uses the makerspace, what they use it for, what difference did it make in their lives. And that brings us to outcome. What difference does any of this make? And we began to try to think about some of the things that we would be looking at that we would say were key outcomes. And of course, key outcomes relate to those goals that we talked about. First of all, we want to be able to have people have individual experiences that they can describe and have that has an impact on their lives. And in some cases, that might be someone who starts a business. It might be someone 
who pursues a career. It might be, you know, it, it's a variety of different things. We don't know exactly what it's going to be in every community, but we know that those are the kinds of outcomes we're looking for. The second goal related to community outcomes, and that, again, we're going to be looking for some community outcomes. We're going to be asking you to, to tell us what difference did it make that you visited 20 organizations in your community and told them about this and invited them to volunteer and invited them to be a part of it. How did that change the fabric of your community? How did it change problem solving in your community? What difference did it make that you invited people into the library for a conversation about some of this and, and how it can be useful to the community? Those are the kinds of things we, we're going to be asking you to tell us. And then in the long run, it's on us to create materials that you can use, but then can also be used by other rural libraries across the country. So that's the third goal. Create something that's halfway useful to other libraries and they can learn from everything you've learned. So, I mean, that's just a, in a nutshell what all these little teeny tiny letters say. And I bet Dagan's going to talk about the milestones and Dagan puts this together for us. So, in, in planning this, we, we really discussed about uh, all of the things that we're asking, all the specific activities that we're asking you and encouraging you to do. and. So we started planning this, and this is a, a living document. This isn't set in stone. So this is kind of how we envision it might work, and I feel like there's a lot of uh, missing activities or, or things that you might do that we hadn't thought of. So um, consider this a, kind of a living document and not set in stone. It's definitely a planning document. So these are some of the milestones that, that we thought sh might happen in, during your implementation. And so it's set in this kind of Gantt format so we can kind of see where some of these key things might happen. So right now we're at like line five or four, welcome webinar with the five libraries. So we're looking at maybe T minus three weeks getting to uh, receiving the equipment. That was kind of in our plan is that we would have this webinar. And so at this time, we, you know, you should be the, those yellow blocks across extension educators and librarians or recruiting trainers if you haven't I've already identified them. Um, all the, your CAT team or your community action team should be meeting and discussing. So these are things we're, we're thinking of and so um, we'd ask you as well to kind of keep track and, and if we need to modify this as we go on. Um, you know, we don't know what we don't know moving forward in meeting our other, um, our other sites after this initial one. So we'll need your input on this hand chart and when you do things. So we're looking at looking down further at like open house and soft open. So after you have the equipment, um, setting it up and training your trainers, and then having an opportunity to have an open house. And maybe that's in week two, not three. Maybe that's right off. Um, you know, we we need your feedback on that. And so this hopefully just um, shows the scope and in, in some of the activities that you'll be doing within your communities. Okay. Yep. That leads us to um, community community engagement. And as Dagan was talking and Mary Jo about the logic model, what occurred to me is communication is going to be as important as anything with this particular project uh, because people are going to question about what is a makerspace, what's going on, how do I get involved. Um, all of those kinds of things and so thinking about your communication strategy I think is going to be critical. Is there a place that your local library already has maybe a Facebook page or a Twitter feed or some sort of an online environment to share that information and that's something that you may want to consider if you don't have one already because in this world of digital communication that's going to be key to get getting the word out. And so that's also working as that catalyst. How do you get people involved? Um, how do you work together? How do you use the talents and the strengths of the people that, that are living in your community? And so reaching out to those people, having those kinds of conversations, trying to connect what they're passionate about with the makerspace um, is going to be kind of fun, but it's also going to be something that you're going to have to strategically think about. This whole concept is really about developing a sense of community, um, meeting people who are doing something different than you are. It's also learning from each other 
and then the ideas and the excitement and the passion just build once we start to build that sense of community. And um, it's just really fun to see the light bulb go off when somebody has an idea or they think that there's a way that we can do it better. So that whole community engagement piece. Um, as you think about your mobile makerspace and as, as you think about the makerspace in your community, really strategize about what the benefits are to you and to your community. Uh, what does it mean to have access to all of this equipment in your community? Think much broader about that and develop that strong community action team. Um, who are the people who can really help you <clears throat> as a librarian and extension folks to be a champion for, for the project and for the initiative, um, not only as it's in the community as a, a temporary piece, but then making that more sustainable in the future. So as we think about that, who is your action team? And many of you have already identified some of those folks, but you really need to think about five to six people um, having a diverse uh, representation from many aspects of your community. And what I found with our Sydney uh, Create project um, was the Chamber Economic Development, the high school principal, Extension, um, our ESU representative, all came together to have that conversation. And believe me, it's not something that is built overnight, that relationship and that trust with those folks, because you're gonna be wanting to develop that relationship in a much stronger way. It took us about three years to get to where we're at. Not saying that that's going to take you guys that long, but we really uh, worked at what is our mission of our makerspace, what's the vision that we have for it, and we've written a vision mission statement. We've got a name for ourselves, Sydney Create. That may not be what you do in the mobile makerspace, but it's something that as you move forward you might want to consider. And we've got a little logo that um, we created together and so it was really a team effort and that's what that engagement that action team is all about um, you're going to want people who are willing to commit some time um, and spend some energy and to focus on not themselves but the whole vision of what this can do for your community um, and, the, and the folks that live there um, you will want to engage and collaborate with those stakeholders and really communicate with them. Maybe even schedule some times to visit one-on-one -on -one with those folks so that they really begin to understand what the benefits are of having that. Sure, the equipment's really cool, but what is the bigger picture of uh, what's important? Um, and then recruit others and their organizations to serve as trainers. Uh, building the capacity within your community and because it's not all about us, whether we're extension or libraries, it's about engaging with the rest of the community and recruiting other people to help us. Because if we only depend on ourselves, what happens when I leave the project? Um, we can't depend on one person to make it sustainable. So we're, we're really looking at building that capacity. And then work to find additional resources, whether that's financial, human, um, idea kind of thing. Because um, if in fact you end up with a permanent makerspace, you're going to need that financial component to come along, um, come along with it. And if we're successful, and these are really some really cool things that can happen, there's additional monies out there, but we've got to have that bigger vision in mind as we think about our community as a whole. <clears throat> so some of the action steps that we've talked about are volunteer coordination. Um, who's going to help volunteer or who's going to coordinate when the volunteers come in, who's going to work at scheduling the times for um, whether it's a, a learning circle or a training session or whatever, how, how, who's going to coordinate that? Um, and again, don't depend on one person to do all that, but it may be a couple of people. Getting people involved in the conversations, people keeping, keeping people engaged, uh, keeping that momentum. What does that look like in your community? And it, again, it's going to be different for everybody. Uh, and each community. Schedule regular times when you want to meet so that people know that on Tuesday it, it becomes um, training Tuesday or um, it becomes uh, mentor Monday, whatever. 
um, but think about a regularly scheduled time um, and you want to do that now so that when you get the equipment you're ready to power on um, and then we also need to celebrate our successes oftentimes we don't take the time to really celebrate we just uh, move on to the next thing so you're going to want to think about at the end of the 20 weeks what does that showcase look like um, what does that um, inventors um, piece look like and um, think about that uh, inventors fair and, and being part of then the innovation studio annual um, fair so that community action team is probably one of the most critical pieces of all of that of, of all of this um, to really empower uh, the people that we serve and the people that we want to engage uh, with that because who ne we never know when that next best widget's going to be created. Thanks, Connie. I, I agree. The celebrating, we've got to do more of that. I'm going to go through this real quickly because uh, you've got worksheets that Joanne sent out to you uh, some time ago and then she reset them again this morning. Um, but basically there's a worksheet for forming your community action team and what their, their roles are include uh, helping with the open house, collecting feedback, getting involved with that maker showcase, and exploring the options for permanent maker space, and then forming a training team. There's a separate worksheet for that. Again, those might be slightly different people because they're there individuals with, uh, in with specific skills and interests, and also people who have training mentoring skills. That may or may not be educators. You might want to include some educators who can teach some classes on these things, but they might also be folks who have an interest in something and are willing to mentor someone else and do one-on-one -on -one, um, assistance to your library customers. Um, they'll be collecting feedback, they'll be providing training. Um, the third thing that was sent out was a just a little worksheet to help you when you're planning your events, just to keep things organized. I know uh, we've got a big event coming up here in uh, Lincoln this weekend, the Celebration Nebraska Books. So I have a big long checklist, so I, I know how helpful they can be. Oh, the templates. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna actually go through the details on the templates. Huh? We might not do this because we don't have much time, but you know those templates, they're the worksheets that Joanne sent out. And again, the event planning form looks something like this. So let's talk about training the trainers. I know we want to spend some time on that. Yeah, so we've got this upcoming uh, next week. And we had a lot of questions about this at the conference last week. Uh, so I want to quickly just walk you through a rough agenda so you guys have an idea of what's going to happen at the event. Um, and then talk about some other ways that you and your community can actually learn these machines better and get some more hands-on experience. Uh, so next week, October 24th and 25th, uh, it'll be very similar both days where in the morning we will talk about you know, some instructional materials on here's how to use this machine. We'll break for lunch for a little bit, and then in the afternoon we'll have a hands-on session where you, as the people participating in the event, will be given you know, a specific task and time to work on that machine so that you can actually get that hands-on experience. The, the very worst thing you can do when you're doing these trainings is take it and then walk away and not touch the machine for a couple months. Mm -hmm. uh, the best way to learn is to actually get your hands dirty, uh, you know, make some mistakes, cut a piece of wood wrong, learn. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure you had time in the afternoon to practice what you just learned. Uh, after next week, uh, the week of the installation when we're coming by and setting this equipment up, uh, we'll be having events at your site uh, with the people that attended the Train the Trainers and then also hopefully some more people from the community uh, to go over those pieces of equipment again uh, and have a little more time to kind of ask some detailed questions uh, and talk about some things that have come up. And uh, after that, the people who attended both the Train the Trainers and that on the site uh, event will become the new trainers for that library. So you'll have all of the curriculum, all the information on how to properly communicate everything you need to know about this machine to the individual users and people who are going to be using it on a regular basis. Um, as far as how you schedule those learning opportunities, uh, a lot of that is going to be up to you. Uh, we've got a, several suggestions and kind of from my own experience, what tends to work best. Uh, I would say the number one item is going to be scheduled trainings. So every three weeks, we need to have a training on the laser. 
where we'll have people sign up. You know, we tend to cap it at three or four, maybe five or six. Uh, and we're going to walk through step by step how to work that specific machine. Uh, outside of that, you know, you're going to have some formal and informal interest groups that are going to come together and coalesce around those machines. Uh, you know, you'll see someone really gets interested in the laser and they really want to learn more about it. So they take it upon themselves and, you know, they work with the other people that are on that individual machine. So that's an example of kind of an informal group. Uh, another one, Connie mentioned, you know, having a group and weekly, maybe bi-weekly, coming together and talking and celebrating your successes and working with each other on those specific items. Uh, that's going to be a really successful way to build this community is to kind of institute, you know, every third Thursday of the month, we're going to get together, talk about what we've made on all the machines, uh, and just kind of have a make club, you know, talk about what has gone well, what hasn't gone well, and what can we work on with that group, uh, you know, to better ourselves and community. And uh, that's everything I want to say on that one, so if we can move on to the next one. Uh, I have a good question. Yes. So, I was just thinking about next week's training. I, um, I heard the question. What time does the training run each day next week? When so, is the Monday? Yep. Tuesday the 24th, uh, we're currently scheduled from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then the next day, the 25th, uh, we're scheduled from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. We're going to make sure people had a little bit of buffer uh, to travel if they needed to. Might be, we might end at 3 on the second day. Was it 4? Um, we'll send out an email. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a, a better agenda as far as what specific machines we're teaching when. Uh, that way, if someone from your community was really interested in one specific machine, uh, they could better schedule that themselves. So, uh, as far as the individual components, uh, if you were at the convention last week, you got a chance to see all of the equipment that we have. And one specific thing I wanted to hit on uh, was people were a little concerned about space. Uh, we did have a ton of wall space that we were able to use last week. Uh, and they were maybe a little concerned with not having enough at their specific library. We do have four stations uh, that will be permanently set up. That'll be the 3D printer, the vinyl cutter, the laser cutter, and the CNC router. Uh, but all the other stations are going to come in totes. So as someone wants to you know, create a button, as they want to work with another piece of equipment, uh, that tote can be brought out and set up on site or for a specific event. Uh, that way, you, know, you don't have to have an entire wall dedicated to this all at one time. Um, but we do have a whole bunch of equipment. I won't walk you through every single piece of it. Uh, but suffice to say, those four are going to be the main ones as far as being permanently set up. And Joanne, you're wanting to know from people who's going to be attending this training, right? Right. Each, each of the five communities do need to let me know um, who is planning on coming those two days. Because we're trying to rework uh, work our schedule so we can have small enough groups that you can learn, mm -hmm. and so you know whether we get a total of twenty people from all five libraries or thirty people might you know depend on how we rework that schedule. So definitely let us know how many people are coming those two days, and then we've got people here that are handling the uh, the motel rooms and that kind of thing. Yes, yeah, Loop City and. Um, Ainsworth will be, uh, will have rooms, uh, the others will be driving in both days because they're close enough. We have a question about the uh, permanent stations, and I think it might be on the website, but I'll ask, what is the anticipated electrical load for the permanent stations? Ooh, as far as the wattage, and um, so I would direct you to the website. I think we have information about the power consumption of each That's individual it. machine. Two of each is... We'll do that after we're done with the sure. slideshow, and then we'll, we'll show you where that's at. Yeah, but on the Library Commission website, which is nlc.nebraska.gov, if you search on Innovation Studios, you can get straight to our innovation, Library Innovation Studios uh, website within our website. And there's a list of equipment that's all on there. I'll show you that after we've had a chance to finish talking about this stuff. And I'm sure you'll probably have more questions from that too on that equipment. Um, but I do, I did send out earlier to you our uh, consumables process information, so you have that. Um, but there's um, several options for people when they're using these machines, uh, where they can 
get and how they use those consumables. They can certainly bring in their own consumables. So if they want to make something with that heat press, uh, you know, they can bring in their own t-shirts or whatnot. Um, so that's one option. There will be some consumables that we will say, no, you have to use ours, for instance, on our 3D printer. Uh, there is a special kind of filament we have to use so that you won't be able to bring in your own. You'll have to use ours. Um, the, again, people can purchase consumables from the stock that we bring. Uh, we'll set prices on those with um, that include sales tax. It's very, it's hardly above what we paid for them. Um, so those will be very reasonable items. Uh, we will, you'll, the libraries will handle the transactions of those, but Nebraska Library Commission will submit all the sales tax for you. So we're going to try to make that as easy as possible. Um, you might want to run a pro, want to visit with local donors, say for instance, uh, an organization, you're going to have uh, an event, kids are going to come in and make t-shirts, they can use our consumable stock, but maybe you might want to have a local donor that says, Okay, at uh, Thursday night's t-shirt making thing, um, the local banker is going to be picking up the cost of the t-shirts for that night. So that's always an option as well. Uh, the library can also purchase uh, consumables and either sell them themselves or give them away, depending on if they got money from the community to do that. Um, and then you can also have a consumables drive. And Max and I are going to are currently working on a list of things that you might want to ask people to bring in, uh, but there are some things that you probably don't want them bringing in, like boards with nails or um, glassware that they just can't use because they're the wrong shape or sizes or whatnot. So we are working, diligently working on that list and we'll get that out to you. And of course, if somebody uh, purchases a, a board and just uses a little piece and leaves the rest left over then that would be free that people could pick up as well. And then here's the next uh, thing just shows uh, some of the things that we have in mind in bringing. You saw a lot of these consumables when you were at a uh, conference. We plan on bringing that all to your library. Um, and then there's some things that we just haven't quite decided, like for instance on the laser cutter and the CNC router. There's other things you can cut, like anodized uh, metal, plastic, acrylic. Uh, we may be buying some of those as well. Uh, but even if we don't buy something and bring it, if we think it's a good product for your uh, customers to do make something with, we are going to be trying to make some samples at next week's uh, training, and then also at training when we come to your community. So even if we're not providing anodized metal for them to purchase on site, we will have some items made out of that so they can see it and touch it. And then we will always include a list of where we think they can buy this, this stuff. Mm -hmm. We rushed along pretty fast, but there isn't much time left, but we want to stay as long as you want to stay and answer any questions that you might have. And then we have the browser and the sign box. So we can stay there. Uh, since there was a question about uh, electrical load, and uh, probably this would help the space too, if people have space questions, you can see this is the, the site here on the Nebraska Library Commission website. And if you go down here to Can you walk them through how to get to this page from the Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So if you can't remember that. Yeah, well, from the left if hand column, you see that grant funding fee rate. Since we received a grant, it is really under that grant funding fee rate. Mm -hmm. But in the search menu in the top right hand side, you can always type in makerspace or Library Innovation Studio, and um, then it'll come up too. So if you can't figure out how to get there. It just right. depends. Some people are more search oriented. Library Innovation Studios takes you right there. So here we are. It's a little bit about the project. Can you just go down here to the right side? Equipment and components. 
And then, there, then we have a list of all the different equipment. And so if you were wondering, let's see, uh, that's CNC router. That's one of the things that's permanent, stays right where it is. Uh, and we and how you would, we don't actually, we have the dimensions and the pounds, but if you see that more information about the car being Venable, we always take you right to the company where it talks about that machine. And so almost everybody will have what they call a, you know, more information about all of this. So I'm sure somewhere in there. Well, and I think if you look at, you can see there's obviously a plug here, right? And a plug here. I know, right? right? Yeah. As far as the amount of power. The total amount of power yes. we don't have on here. So, so I, I would recommend if you're concerned uh, about maybe maxing out the amount of power you can draw, uh, take a look at each of those websites, the specific manufacturer, because they'll list the, the peak power consumption um, kind of in the details. And as we find that, we can add that to our website. Yep. So we'll have the, the dimensions, the weight, and the power dimensions. Does that be under specifications? Is that where that would be? It's going to vary for each, you know. Yeah. But it could be, yeah. Yeah, the specifications. We can have, we'll have Craig uh, look that up and put that on there. To make that easier. Any other questions that you have about um, any of this? Yeah, Karen of Plattsmith wants to know, since you'll be in Plattsmith in less than two weeks, uh, when will you have ready the list of consumables to be donated by the public? Uh, the only item remaining on that is for me to take a look and experiment a little bit with our rotary fixture for the laser. So uh, ending, I can find 30 minutes this afternoon. Uh, we can get it out to you this afternoon. Amazing. <laughs> and then, and you're going to want to uh, let your community know because obviously some of you might have space issues for storage. So um, you can look at that list and say, hey, we don't want people bringing in piles of wood. So let's take that off the list. So you can adjust that list if you really are looking for certain things and really want to stay away from other things because of space issues. Or they could store them somewhere else, you know. Right. That's another possibility. If you can work with the fire station or something for some storage. <laughs> Just guessing. Maybe. Get creative. Yeah. Well, and, and to go a little bit along with that is um, any opportunity that you have to present or share to any of your organizations about the mobile makerspace prior to it coming, I think that would be as beneficial as well in terms of maybe somebody has some supplies that they can contribute that may not. But it's just getting that word out of presenting this information that you are one of the 30 communities in the state that is hosting that and that is extremely special. And um, take advantage of all opportunities to um, share that, uh, that good news. Yeah, I would be looking at your community calendar for the next four weeks and try to attend every meeting you can find, every organization that will let you come and talk about it for a few minutes and recruit volunteers. Now's the time. And really, you can also um, check with your manufacturers in the community and find out what type of uh, scrap material they have. If they make something with acrylic or plastic or anodized metal, or wood, they might have a really nice pile, of little scraps, and uh, as you saw, um, Max made um, name tags and other things yesterday. Sometimes you just need a little scrap to make something. Well, a lot of times these cabinet shops uh, don't want to keep those small cutoffs because they're too small for them to use, uh, and so a lot of the times they honestly go into a burn pile or in the trash. And so if you know you can help them out and save them from having to strike a match, they may like that. <laughs> Are there other questions before we set you free to go have lunch? I have a, um, Gail Ainsworth just says, thanks for the info. Can't wait to meet everyone in person to start training on the equipment. Very good. See you next week. Yeah. And if you have any feedback from last, what you saw last week at conference, uh, you know, get that out to us on 
whatever that feedback might be. And I'll be in plasma tomorrow at five. And I, you know, I think I failed to tell the city when I was there uh, that if you schedule a meeting with your community action team, I remember telling all the others that let me know when that is, and I will. Uh, I can call in and be on speaker phone uh, for that meeting if they have any questions for me. Thanks, everyone. Looking forward to it, and thank you for being our first group. <laughs> The pioneers, yeah. You know, I was going to ask you, all right, so I'm going to